Germany finds itself in a very difficult situation. Um, from the point of view of Germany's self-interest, it has every interest in very good relations with China, because really the German economy and the Chinese economy are almost perfect fits. What is Germany very good at? Germany is very, very good at producing machine tools, uh, uh, factory equipment, uh, capital goods. It produces the very high quality, very competitively priced. It's one of the world's best uh, producers on that. And China um, can't produce some of these things and wants to buy this high quality equipment from Germany. And China then uses this high quality equipment from Germany to produce things which Germany can't produce very effectively. That is, China leads the world in, in consumer goods production, manufacturing. It leads the world in medium technology goods. It leads the world in what, what you could call um, low high level high technology, if that's not a bit paradoxical. But I mean, I mean things like um, computers, mobile phones, and things of like that. In some cases, of course, it leads the world in high end high technology, for example, Huawei and 5G, but that's only a few companies. In general, China's not there. So you have a perfect, perfect fit. Germany exports very high quality machinery to, to China, which China then used to produce consumer goods, which it then sells back to Germany. So these, these then fit very, very perfectly. But this is very bad for the United States because it allows the German economy to grow rather quickly. And it leads to the question, if that Germany has good relations with China. If my memory is correct, I think Merkel visited uh, China twice a year, basically, during the time of her chancellorship. And the United States doesn't like this at all. Now, the new German chancellor finds himself in a difficult situation. On the one hand, his economy has been damaged by the war in Ukraine. This is incredibly bad for Germany's economy. It cuts off its cheap energy supply of Russian gas. It cuts off some of its export markets. It creates inflation. This is really bad news from the economy of uh, Germany created by the United States. So it's Germany's biggest single export market as a country is China. So obviously the German chancellor would therefore like to have good relations with China. And therefore I assume that he's coming to China in order to pursue good trade relations and economic relations with China, which is in his interest. The problem is that the United States doesn't want this. So therefore I would think that he's gonna be caught in a nasty uh, trap between on the one hand and what is in the economic interests of Germany and on the other hand, what is in the aggressive interests of the United States. And this is a rather hot potato, as they would say in English, to, for, the, um, for the Chancellor to deal with. I mean, I hope that he acts sensibly and wants good relations with China. And the fact that he's come into China indicates that, but the United States will not like this and it will therefore put uh, further pressure on. So Europe is one of the two places in the world where there is a real argument going on about its relations with China. Most places in the world, you know who's going to win between the United States and China. In North America, the United States is going to win. In Australia, the United States is going to win. In Japan, the United States is going to win. In Africa, China's going to win. In Southeast Asia, China's going to win. In the Middle East, China's going to win. The only two places in the world where it's not clear whether there is a real fight going on is on the one hand, Europe, and the other is Latin America. Uh, these, are the two part, these are the two parts of the world in which it's not clear who's going to win. Um, in this situation. So therefore, the situation in Europe is obviously of great um, interest. The United States is attempting to prevent the Chinese people having a good standard of living. Let's put it bluntly like that. But what that means is it want, the United States wants the United States to continue to be the world's largest economy. That's what, for example, Edward Luce in the um, Financial Times pointed out. But this is impossible. China has more than four times the population of the United States. That means that when the population of China reaches even one quarter of the per capita GDP of the United States, or roughly speaking, when, when the living standard in China reaches one quarter of that of the United States, China will become the world's largest economy. It's just a question of arithmetic. Yes. If the United States wants to maintain its position as the world's largest economy, it therefore has to ensure that the Chinese people remain, you could call it poor, you could call it have a low standard of living, but that the Chinese people must never be allowed 
to have even one quarter of the living standards of the United States. And obviously the Chinese population is never going to accept this. Why should they have a low standard of living so the United States can remain the world's most biggest economy? Incidentally, in about 30 or 40 years time, the United States will confront the same problem with India because Indian people who are also four times as many as the United States are not going to accept that they can have one quarter of the living standard. So the United States is therefore attempting to force the, the, the Chinese population to remain at a much, much lower living standard than they could achieve. And the Chinese people quite rightly, like as any self-respecting country will do, will not accept this. Now, the situation then is even more serious because in peaceful economic competition, the United States is losing the competition to China. Not merely obviously during the last um, 40 or odd years since the uh, reform and opening up as China's economy grown many, very, very much faster than uh, the United States. But look at it in each of the crises which has come. In the period since the 2008 financial crisis, uh, China's economy has grown more than five times as fast as the United States. Since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, even although China was hit by COVID, uh, China's economy has grown more than three times as fast as uh, the United States. So if you have peaceful competition, the United States is going to lose. But the great danger to the world is that the United States still maintains great military uh, power. The United States spends more on military power than the next military spending than the next nine countries put together. There is only one field of military um, power in which the United States really has an equal. That is in the field of nuclear weapons with Russia. That is because Russia inherited the nuclear arsenal of the Soviet Union. There, they're about equal. But in every other field, um, the United States ahead is much ahead in conventional spending. The United States has many more nuclear warheads uh, than does China. Now, if you're economically losing, but militarily strong, then the great danger is that you will be tempted to decide to use your military power in order to try to uh, maintain your position. We could make a comparison, for example, to the first Cold War, the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Here, in a certain sense, this was the reverse of the present policy towards the United States. The Soviet Union was economically not, not nearly as strong as the United States. At, even at its peak, the Soviet Union never even had half the economic size of the United States. So we may say that the Soviet Union was economically weak, but the Soviet Union was militarily strong because it devoted a very high proportion of its economy to military spending, and it was roughly the equal of the United States. So therefore, we could say that the United States had found a situation where it was economically strong confronted with the Soviet Union, um, but militarily weak. Well, under those circumstances, the interest of the United States was to have the competition on the economic field. Even Reagan's military buildup in the 1980s didn't really um, aim to have a war with the Soviet Union. It would have liked, you know, if it could have gained some technological advantage or other, it, it might have thought about it. That, but that wasn't the real goal. The real goal was to put intolerable strain on the Soviet economy. And it was very successful in this. It created a crisis. So therefore, in the first Cold War, given the formerly US economically strong, militarily weaker, the interest of the United States was to move issues onto the economic terrain, not the military one. That's one of the reasons why the Cold War never became a hot war. In the case of uh, present United States, it's the opposite. It is losing to China economically, but it is militarily strong. So therefore, we have the formula United States economically weak, militarily strong. Under those circumstances, the temptation of the United States is to attempt to move struggles onto the military sphere. The most extreme cases of this are there are people in the United States, I don't mean peripheral figures, I mean people within the US foreign policy establishment, who call for a war with China over Taiwan. I mean, they advocate it. They say, we want a war with uh, China over Taiwan. They argue that this would be a non-nuclear war, that it could be controlled. Now, they're a minority view because 
um, the majority of the US population thinks that you, or the, and not merely the population, but the US foreign policy establishment thinks you can't guarantee that a conflict with China won't become a nuclear conflict. So the, the open view that we want a war with China about Taiwan is at the present time a minority one, but not, not completely peripheral in the United States. There are also many ways of using military power indirectly. Uh, you can, for example, force countries who you protect militarily to have bad relations with China. For example, Australia is at the present time carrying out an extremely stupid policy because it's economically, uh, China is its biggest customer. As, as China is economically vital for Australia, it should want good relations with uh, China. But instead, the United States is forcing it using military, the fact that we control you, Australia, because we defend you militarily, to have bad relations between Australia and China. Same situation exists with Japan. In Japan, uh, Japan and China, um, China is China's, uh, Japan's greatest trading partner. Japan should want good relations with China, but the United States doesn't want this. And the United States says, look, Japan, we defend you. We're responsible for your military powers. You will carry out our foreign policy, and we don't want you to have good relations with, um, with China. So therefore, the United States can use its military power uh, indirectly, as well as actually fighting war. So therefore, I'm afraid that given this combination of situation, as the United States economy is not going to improve, and as there is a limited period during which the United States will maintain its military supremacy, because obviously if, if China's economy grows very much, eventually the military power of China will be equal to that of the United States, but that won't occur in the next 10 years. So therefore the great temptation, the great danger is the United States will resort to military means in order to try to have, um, to deal with the situation which confronts China. There are also other dangers, for example, on climate change. But so I think, unfortunately, we are entering into a very dangerous period uh, for humanity due to this situation which exists with the United States.